thank you, Declan, and uh, thank you, Koyo and Woodrow, for inviting me. Um, and when uh, Koyo, uh, we spoke about the invitation, she asked me if I would talk about my work with uh, modern and contemporary Indian art, which, as Declan said, I've been engaged with for um, around 15 years, on and off. Um, and one of the things that I thought to talk about, <clears throat> particularly in relation to this question of history and the sort of residue of history which um, Koyo mentioned in her introduction yesterday, and the idea of um, the past resonating in the present um, through the work of artists, was to look at some of the research I've done um, in terms of Indian art history, which has been not so much as an art historian, but more, more as a curator. So I've sort of approached um, Indian art history through a series of curatorial projects, and very much as a way to inform myself, educate myself um, about that history, but also about the um, legacy and the genealogies that lead up to contemporary work, so that I can have a better understanding of those. And this was in part um, inspired by uh, visits to India in the starting of the mid 90s and also in response to the quite dramatic emergence of contemporary Indian art in the 2000s, uh, but in such a way that, it, that the focus was absolutely on the contemporary, and there was a kind of, in a way, a gap in relation to where that work had come from. So my first, oh, slides are already amiss. So my first visit to India was in 1995, and I went on a, a sort of, slightly informal research trip. And my introduction to the Indian art world was actually through um, education institutions, so art colleges. And <clears throat> subsequently, I, I came to realize how important the art college was, um, not only in relation to the development of art, but also as part of um, anti-colonial movements and the decolonization of culture, um, pre-independence, and also after independence. And so the first, the first image um, is of JJ School of Art in, in Bombay. And this was actually one of the, the British schools. Um, so in, in the mid-19th century, the British established a series of government schools in India. Um, and these had a rather particular effect. So they introduced the notion of a kind of academic approach to art making, um, realist portrayal um, of, the, of the body and of nature. Um, and the separation of art and craft. So this division between, this sort of hierarchy between art and craft didn't exist so much in, in Indian uh, visual culture. Um, and this was very much something which was implemented by the British. Um, by the end of the 19th century, there was a, a turn against this uh, from within the government college system. So um, the uh, director of the government school in Calcutta, Ernest Havel, um, the, uh, brought in an Indian artist called Ab Abhinindranath Tagore to try and what he described as purge the um, Indian education system of Western influences and to turn towards um, the history of, of visual uh, production in India, including, for example, looking at uh, early uh, cave paintings, mobile miniatures, and to sort of enrich and, and renew those traditions. But the most important, sorry, this is sort of banging. Uh, the most important development in the early 20th century was the school that was set up by Rabindranath Tagore in 1919. Uh, it's called Kalabhavan in Shantaniketan. This is an image from uh, 1940 when Gandhi came to, to visit um, Kalabhavan. And what was interesting about this initiative was that while Gandhi was developing his non-cooperation movement, um, Tagore turned to education and to art education in particular as a way to address uh, colonization. Um, and probably most of you know of Rabindranath Tagore. He was uh, a poet, a Nobel Prize winner. And in fact, he was um, someone promoted by Yeats. Um, so Yeats um, wrote the introduction to his book, Gitanjali, for which he won the Nobel Prize. Um, he was also a visual artist, and he was particularly interested in the visual arts and craft, um, as well as theater, um, song, he had his very diverse uh, practice. Um, and he, through his 
Nobel Prize. He became internationally famous, and in the 1920s, he traveled all over the world, to Europe, uh, to the United States, to Russia, China, Japan, and <clears throat> developed a sort of extremely cosmopolitan network of links and connections. And he also raised money um, through his lecture tours. And this money was invested back into the art college in, in uh, Shantan Aketan in West Bengal. Um, as well as resources, he also brought knowledge. So he collected books, he brought artists, he brought an art historian, a woman called Stella Cranbridge, who he met in London, um, who had a link to the Bauhaus. And she came to uh, Shantan Aketan in the early 1920s, and she taught a course on um, European art from Gothic to Dada. So she introduced um, the, the sort of stream of, of avant-garde European art, in fact. It was very much about sort of bypassing the British, escaping from the academic hold of the, the, the British government schools, <coughs> and looking to the European avant-garde, but also looking to um, other Asian situations. So there was a particular interest, for example, in Japanese culture and Tagore traveled to Japan for the first time in 1916, and was very inspired by um, art and craft production in Japan, and what he saw to be the link between that and uh, sociality and function. So the second slide is of uh, one of the studios, um, in, in Calab the painting studio at Calababan. Um, and this was, um, what was interesting was that although um, there was a, a focus on um, painting, sculpture, that this was very much about, and this is in a way um, perhaps not an indicative image, because what was very important for the Shantan Aketan artist was to, to take work out of the studio and into a social context. So much of the work at Shantan Aketan produced by artists and students was in the public domain. Um, one of the uh, important links um, to the for Kalabavan in terms of connecting to a European avant-garde was to the Bauhaus. Um, and I think it's important to say that the, the Bauhaus wasn't an influence on um, Shantan Kate and Kalabavan. It was actually could be seen as a parallel because the two schools were established in the same year, in 1919. Um, and in uh, 1921, Tagore traveled to Weimar, and he visited the Bauhaus, and there he observed these uh, quite remarkable parallels between the two institutions. Um, there was a focus on um, a continu continuation between art and craft, a focus on the workshop, which you have in the Bauhaus, uh, a focus on social function, and I think very importantly, an uh, uh, investigation of the language of modernism in relation to uh, social and political upheaval. Um, so in the case of the Weimar, the defeat in the war um, and the rise of nationalism. And in Kalabavan, um, the, the, colonize, the British colonization of India. Um, and in 1922, uh, coming out of this visit to the Weimar, um, and partly through Tagore's influence, the first exhibition um, from outside of Germany of the Bauhaus took place in Kolkata, um, in the Indian um, Oriental Society of Arts. And there was shown there works by Clay, Kandinsky, Feininger, um, Itten, and others on, in one part of the <coughs> gallery. And in the other part of the gallery, there were works by what was known as the Bengal School. So a group of artists that were grouped around Abhinindra Tagore, who were interested in defining a, um, a, a specifically Indian uh, visual arts language. And this is an image of uh, Tagore in Japan, where he was visiting the art historian Nakakura Tenshin. Um, and these are some of the um, important artists from Kalabavan. So in the, set, in the, in the in front of the image is uh, Nandalal Bose, and Nandalal Bose um, was brought by Tagore to Shantanikhetan from Calcutta um, in order to develop a curriculum. And so it's been said of Nandalal Bose that he played a role a little bit like um, Walter Gropius, so he was the person that was responsible for putting um, Tagore's ideas about art into practice. Although there was never a manifesto like 
the work of the, with the Bauhaus. Um, it was more um, <clears throat> through practice and um, through translating of some of Tagore's ideas about art, about modernism, about primitivism, about politics, um, that over the decades, and by the 1930s, you had something like a, an established ethos. Um, and this included, um, this included the idea of art as something which was um, not uh, for commodity, not for not something which would be professionalized, but something which would have a very important role in terms of um, community life. So there was an emphasis on mural painting, for example, uh, public sculpture, and also craft. <clears throat> and one of the uh, important influences for Nandalal Bose was Gandhi. And Gandhi sought out Nandalal Bose and uh, asked him to uh, help him develop his thinking around the place of art. And of course, the influence was reciprocal. Um, and he also commissioned Nandalal Bose to make posters for um, the Congress. Um, so, for example, there was a very important Congress um, in the 1930s. And at this, for this, Nandalal Bose made a series of political posters. And he put them on a structure that was similar to um, one that might be used in a village context. And this idea of <clears throat> the rural, the village, the artisan as being at the heart of uh, national regeneration was obviously a Gandhian idea, and it was something that was incorporated into um, Nandalal's thinking around the curriculum. Having said that, um, he also, <clears throat> he also uh, like Tagore, was interested in making a cosmopolitan situation for the artists, at, uh, for the, the students at Shantaniketan. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, one of the important things was the, the, the materials that were brought back by Tagore on his, from his trips. Um, so he collected books from different parts of the world and made these available to um, the artists. So they had access to different art movements such as Cubism, Expressionism, Surrealism, and so forth. And they often incorporated these in uh, eclectic ways, mixing them with um, traditions from um, the Indian context. So one of the um, major artists, one of the other major artists from Shantanaketan was an artist called Ramkin Kabaij. And this is a work from 1938 called Santal Family. Um, and this is a work which is um, known, has been called the first outdoor modernist sculpture in India. Um, so it has a kind of significant place in Indian art history. And uh, Ramkin Kabaij, he joined the school in 1925. He came from a very humble background, and he had a connection to the tribal people of that region, who were called the Santali. Um, and he, throughout his career, he made <coughs> repeated representation of Santali tribal people, and also um, peasant workers. And he, along with the ethos that Tagore had at Kalabavan, he also brought a um, an influence of the left communist movement to his work. So this uh, sculpture is a representation of uh, migrant workers, uh, sharecroppers, and they're also Santali tribals. So it has a kind of particular um, political um, importance, I think, in terms of um, registering the marginalization of these groups. It's also a work which is, uh, in, term, in, in formal terms, it's a composite of different styles. So you can see the influence of um, uh, Europe, early 20th century European sculpture, but you can also see the influence of um, Indian tribal sculpture and temple sculpture. And as part of um, an exhibition that I made in 2008, I commissioned artists to make a response to this work. So part of, my, part of my thinking around uh, this exhibition was to introduce this history into, into a contemporary art discourse beyond India. Um, so I've been invited by the museum where I worked at the time in, in Belgium to make an exhibition of contemporary Indian art. Um, and I was a little bit resistant to do that, to, to frame an exhibition in that way. Um, and also to, to frame it both in terms of nation and in terms of contemporary. 
Um, so what they chose to do was to take this sculpture, um, Sunflower Family, as a starting point, and to propose it to artists from India, but also a European artist, um, artists, from, artists from different parts of the world, to, to make a response to this very specific um, moment in, in Indian history, um, and to, in a way, unpack the sculpture. And in addition to that, I also um, used archival material that referred to this history of, of Shantaniketan and early 20th century cosmopolitanism in India um, and, and the political implications of the sculpture as well. Um, and one of the commissions was from a Santali artist. And I think what's interesting to, to also mention in relation to this is the way that um, I mean, it's very familiar to people that in, in the early 20th century, and I think this was discussed briefly yesterday in the presentation, that there was an appropriation of um, um, primitive, so-called primitive artifacts. And this, this was there for sure in the Shantaniketan context, where there was a fascination with the Santali people who were seen as um, untainted by colonial rule, colonial culture, and also uh, they were heroic figures in the sense that they were instrumental in the uprising against the British in, in, the mid in, in 1855. Um, so they were sort of valorized at the same time as they were marginalized economically. But they became, a, they became sort of cultural, a cultural motif and cultural icon. But what's, what's interesting is that <clears throat> there was a proximity between the artists and um, the subjects. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, Ramkin Kabaj, he, he had very close connections with Santali people, and it, it, apparently there's a story that when he made this work, he consulted the Santals. The Santals would walk past the, the, the um, campus every day where he was making his sculpture, and he would ask them, and they wouldn't do. I mean, perhaps it's not true, but I think it sort of indicates that this relationship and this idea of primitivism <coughs> was, was something uh, a little bit different. Um, and for the exhibition, um, Santal Family, um, I worked with an art historian from Palabhavan called Anshuman Dasgupta. Um, and he has an extremely um, obviously deep knowledge of this history and the, the situation there. And one of the things that Tagore did when he set, established the school was to um, invite a group of Santali tribal people to come and live um, on the campus and to invite young people from the tribe to come and train as artists, and that still is the case to, to this day. And so this was a, a commission that we made from a Santali artist who'd been trained at Kalabhavan, um, and <coughs> called Bharat Hamza, and these were uh, depictions of uh, famous uh, figures from Santali history. So the one in the front, I've forgotten his name, I think he's called Kani, he was one of the people that was involved in the uprising in the 1850s. Other people would be the important musicians or healers and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and then a very different kind of commission was from a Polish artist called Groszka Matsuga. And this was a work called Romanus Modernism, um, which was named, in fact, after Peter Kapoor's book, where she, she questions the periodization of modernism. Um, and Goshka came to Shantaniketan with me on a research trip and um, was fascinated by the work of the students. So there were, there were, in the campus, there were, there were a huge number of works that had been abandoned and left around the campus. And she was fascinated by the formal qualities of these works and also by the affinity to the kind of work that she had made as a student in Poland in the 80s. So it also drew a line under this question of art college pedagogy, um, how certain kind of forms of modernism persisted in different parts of the world in different times. And she drew, she collected these works from the students and then installed them in an installation that invoked something of this natural setting, of, I mean, in very, obviously, very staged kind of way of, of Shantani Ketan. How am I doing for time? Two minutes. OK, I'll be very quickly. Um, so to link it to the present, um, this is a mural by an artist called K.G. Subramaniam. He was <coughs> he came to Shantaniketan in 1944, trained with Nandalal Bose and Rankin Kabaj. So it was really the recipient of this particular cultural um, milieu. Um, but then went on to become a very important teacher in his own right. So in the 1950s, he moved to Baroda in Gujarat, which then became the preeminent um, college 
um, in India in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, so he took some of the ethos of Shantanikhetan with him, um, and he was also involved in consulting about the development of the design school in Ahmedabad, which was another very important uh, post-independence initiative. But as a, as a teacher, he, um, he, one of his, his, his students, and I'll go really quickly now, and we can maybe pick it up in the, in the conversation, one of his students was an artist that I worked with. Um, in fact, he made an exhibition here at the Museum of Modern Art called Sheila Gowda. Um, and she talked very, we talked, she told me um, about uh, the, the, his pedagogical approach and some of the things which um, were brought across from the early 20th century and the concerns that the artists had at that time, which was really to think about a sort of um, a kind of modernist language of art and design that would um, also incorporate and be relevant to an Indian context and really address um, the history not only of what we would call painting perhaps, but also folk art, vernacular craft, and so forth. And um, how this was sort of incorporated also into her practice uh, in terms of uh, still um, addressing these questions in the, 90, in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, so her work, just to say very briefly, her, in her work she, um, generally what she does is she produces sculptures which reflect, have a sort of concern with the, the, the language of modernism but are made from very particular material. So this is a work called Collateral, um, which is made from the agabati, which is the, um, used for incense. And she, she, she makes it into pats, and then she produces forms, and she burns them, and they leave this residue. Um, this is a work which is made with threads, um, and <coughs> kumkum, which is the, the, the red material which is used in uh, bindi dots. Uh, this is a work which is using hair, human hair, um, but on a kind of monumental scale. And then finally, and I'll, and I'll finish, this, this is a, a piece called Kage Bangra, and this was the work that uh, I commissioned, we commissioned for the uh, Santa Family show. And what was very interesting about uh, her situation in particular was that when we asked her to respond to the sculpture and to Rankin Kabaij, she was, of course, very familiar with that because she'd studied at Shantanikhetan, she studied with K.G. Subramanian. And in this work, she addressed um, the, the modernist language of the sculpture, but I think referring to a different period of modernism, maybe a, a sort of mid-century um, color field painting version of modernism. But she also referred to the, the narrative of the painting, this idea of the migrant worker. So um, the material that this sculpture is made from is uh, these, uh, tar drums, which are <clears throat> used by uh, workers who tarmac the roads, who come from rural areas to the city, and the tar is contained in the drums, and when they've emptied the drums, they flatten the tar, and they, they turn these into temporary shelters. So, secreted in the sculpture, and I'm afraid you can't see very clearly, but inside these forms, there are little uh, living spaces, which reflect um, the, the temporary dwellings that are made by the migrant workers. So I'll finish there and then hopefully we can expand more in the discussion.